the city of Jerusalem where uh, the events of Acts chapter 2 took place and quite honestly a lot of other events uh, that have to do with the life of Christ and the history of Christianity is it's an ancient city. There's a lot of history there. There's a lot that's happened there over the course of time. I, I, this is not based on any research, but I feel just on, on impression, I feel like the, Jerusalem has a much longer story, so to speak, than a lot of other places. Uh, just because so much has happened there, like historic big things. And wh- one of the things I looked up as I was um, just reflecting on the city of Jerusalem and its history is that it's, the name means city of peace, which is actually, if you think about it, is, is, it's quite ironic. Look at these statistics. First of all, the city of Jerusalem has been besieged 23 times, attacked 52 times, captured and recaptured 44 times, partially destroyed at least 40 times and completely destroyed on two separate occasions, one being in 70 AD by the Romans and then the other one, which, which has um, there's a lot more ink, so to speak, in the Bible with regard to the other destruction of Jerusalem, 586 BC, when the Israelites were taken off into exile by the Babylonians. So again, it's ironic that the name means city of peace, and yet, as I, as I consider these numbers, that doesn't sound at all peaceful. And the double irony, though, is the fact that it was in this, this city, Jerusalem, this unstable, volatile, conflicted city of Jerusalem, where the Lord established peace. He established peace between himself and humanity through the life of death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was born not, not in Jerusalem, not, but not far away in Bethlehem. His crucifixion happened right there, right outside Jerusalem, resurrection right outside Jerusalem. This, this conflicted city is where the Lord established peace between himself and humanity. And it's also the city from, when, from which peace went out into the world, starting on Pentecost, as we heard in our lesson from Acts chapter 2. Just a little background on Pentecost. I know for myself, uh, growing up, and for I don't know how many years, I felt like Pentecost was a New Testament thing that, uh, that, that started with the events of Acts chapter 2. But there's a reason why all those people were in town. This was an Old Testament festival. It was a harvest festival. The Lord, we, we can go back to the Old Testament and hear where the Lord commands it. He tells uh, the Israelites in Exodus 34 verse 22, he says, celebrate the festival of weeks. That's another name for uh, Pentecost, as they celebrated it, uh, with the first fruits of the wheat harvest. So it was, a, it was a harvest festival. People came to Jerusalem to celebrate the goodness of God, how he had blessed them in so many ways, particularly with the harvest. And, and as such, it was one of three major festivals for which Israelites at least wanted to be in Jerusalem. It was a big deal. It was something for which a lot of Israelites went to Jerusalem to celebrate. And so, again, there was a lot of foreigners there, a lot of travelers. You heard that in our lesson from Acts chapter 2. It talks about Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Rome, Cretans, Arabs, just people from all over the place. But you know what I think is cool? When I consider how, how all these nations, all these cultures came together in Jerusalem, the Lord brought the world to Jerusalem before the apostles would go out into the world. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. He said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. But before that happened, the earth came to him. The earth came to the apostles, rather. God, before they went out, God brought the world to them. And and this is what we then call the birthday of of the New Testament Christian church. This is where the Lord set the foundation for the New Testament church. It was on that day, as we heard in in verse 4 of Acts chapter 2, that the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, if you were there that day, and no no doubt you would have at least heard of Jesus, whether or not you're a believer, um, uh, whether or not, depending, regardless of what you thought of, of these apostles of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit of God, by simple observation, no matter what you thought of all that other stuff, by a simple observation, you knew that something 
absolutely extraordinary was taking place. Something absolutely unprecedented was happening with the disciples right there in front of their eyes. This, this was huge. And, 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 and that's why we're told, in bewilderment, a large crowd gathered and utterly amazed. They asked, aren't all, the, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? I, I want to pick up on that word amazed. Because that's what happens when the Holy Spirit works. People do amazing things. In the case here, on Pentecost, the disciples spoke in languages that they had never spoken before. And not only do people do amazing things when the Holy Spirit's at work, but there are amazing results. We're told at the end of, of that, or near the end of that chapter, end of our lesson from Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls came to faith that day. 3,000 individuals who didn't embrace Christ as their Savior did on that day. 3,000 souls entered God's family and were heirs of eternal life in heaven. That's awesome. That is amazing. That is certainly a beautiful, beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit did that day. You know, you know as I consider this, and, and perhaps you too, I know over the course of my life, I've, I've wondered, you know, the, the, the apostles spoke in languages they had never spoken before. We call that speaking in tongues. And I know for myself, I've wondered at times, does that still happen today, or why or why not? And, and I know that there are those who say, yeah, it happens all the time, you know, at, at certain churches, and, and there are others that say, nope, it doesn't happen at all. It was more of from Bible times. It was a first century thing. There's no need for it. I know for myself personally, when, when there's something that I, I can't say definitively, when something I don't know, I go to the things I do know. And what we know is that the gift of speaking in tongues is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's God. And so technically, he can give that gift to whomever, whenever, wherever he so chooses. At the same time, I would say it's worth noting that, that the Lord has a habit. He has a long history of operating in different ways with different people during different eras in history. So, for example, the Lord communicated with Abraham in a way very different than he communicates with us today. Today we have his word. It's the same, same God, same truths, same promises. And yet, we ha we, we, God communicates through this book called the Bible. Whereas with Abraham, it's like he had these one-on-one -on -one dialogues with him. Very, very different. And so, instead of focusing on, on what we don't know, which, to be quite honest, isn't, isn't the most important part here, let's focus on, again, this amazing, beautiful thing that was happening. The thing that is most important, the fact that, that Jesus told his apostles, I want you to go into the world, I want you to share your faith boldly, confidently, without hesitation, and they did that. And the fact that when the gospel is shared, when the word is proclaimed, the Holy Spirit is present. He is active. He is working through that word to create faith, to strengthen faith, to bring people into his family, to keep people into his family, to give peace, to give confidence, to give joy, to give hope. And again, that's what happened here. On Pentecost, the, the spiritual gift that was most prominent, obviously, was the speaking in tongues that the apostles did. On other occasions, including today, the, the, the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, um, other gifts, I should say, are, are more prominent. But the reality is that, regardless, it's the same Spirit at work. We, we heard a lot about that work uh, when I read the lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It says there, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. A, a manifestation is an outward or, or, or an observable indication or sign of something that's more abstract. So, for example, you can't see sorrow, but you can see it on someone's face. You can see tears. Tears are a manifestation of sorrow. You can't see an infection, but you can take a person's temperature and say, oh, they got an infection. So a, a fever is, and that's the next one, a fever is a manifestation of, of an infection. Did, has anyone ever come home to this scene? Anyone with an animal? I know I have. When we were a kid, I was, honestly, I was, this isn't my dog, um, but we came home to something. It was like the whole kitchen and the whole basement. This dog destroyed the place. 
And it was too hilarious to be mad, uh, for me to be mad. Uh, but this here, th this is a manifestation of a dog's boredom, right? Uh, you can't see the dog's boredom, but most certainly, uh, you see the results of, of the animal's boredom, right? So here, what we have, and, and what the, what's talked about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, uh, the gifts for serving the Lord, spiritual gifts that the Bible talks about, those are manifestations of the Spirit. Also in 1 Corinthians 12, verses prior, uh, it says there, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. The Holy Spirit gives different gifts and different amounts and different combinations to different people at different times, for different reasons, under different circumstances. But it's still the same Spirit who gives those gifts. And I would say that He gives gifts to every single one of them. One of the things that I like about this verse, it says, to each one, and you find that, it, it, that phrase, either to each one or each one of you or each of us, repeated numerous times in this chapter, and it's also elsewhere in Scripture. And, and what I love about that phrase, especially if you read through the, the, the chapter, this chapter of 1 Corinthians 12, um, it, it, it happens so many times that you can't ignore it. And, and my point is that everyone is gifted. I know for myself, being, being in the position as I am as a pastor, I've heard it. It doesn't happen often. I'm very thankful for that. But every once in a while, I hear someone say, I don't have any gifts. I, I, I don't know what I do, what I can do. I, I, and, and they literally feel that they don't have anything to offer. And that always saddens me. It, it saddens me because it's not true. And, and when I say that, I don't mean to beat anyone over the head who's thinking that way. I, I say that to say, please know that's not true. To each one, gifts have been given by the Holy Spirit, by God. God doesn't see you as someone without gifts. God doesn't see you as someone without skills, without abilities, without something to offer. Again, you heard that almost that whole chapter in 1 Corinthians 12. And it says all the parts, no matter what, they're all important. They're all, everyone's gifted. Everyone's important. Everyone contributes. Each of us is a part of the body of Christ. That is a beautiful truth. God doesn't see anyone as not gifted. You know why? Because he made each and every one of you. And he knows he's given you gifts. You know, perhaps in a similar, in a similar realm or related to that, you know, it, for us as human beings, um, we have a tendency sometimes to look at other people and to say, I wish I had what they have. I wish I had, and I'll give you, here, here's a real life example. Uh, we have friends who, shall we say, bought the dip in the, uh, in the housing market back around 2008 here in Southern California. I wish I had bought the dip back in 2008 here in Southern California, right? I mean, and I look at them and it's like, wow, I wish I had done that. You know, so we look at others, we, we, we say, I wish, I wish I had what they have, you know, whether it's a house or a car or whatever other worldly possessions or, or, or maybe it's accomplishments relative to, to school, relative to work, relative to life in general, whatever it might be. Uh, we, we look at other people's abilities, their, their skills, and we, we, we think, oh, I wish I had more of that personality, or I wish I had more of, of that kind of um, organization, or more of, of that leadership, or whatever, more of that empathy. We, we look at others and we say, I wish I had more of what they have. And, and first of all, it's, it's, it's okay to save up for something. Right? It, it, that's not, I'm not saying that that's a problem. It's okay to save up for the down payment on the house. It's okay to go after your goals and accomplishments. In fact, we can most certainly make the argument that that's good stewardship, good management of what God has given you in terms of your time and, and your abilities and what, what God, your body, using your life to glorify God. Right? We, I, it, it's not, there's nothing wrong with with trying to better yourself. You know, you, you see an area where you're weak, and so you work on that. You know, you take a class, or you read a book, or whatever it may be. Th nothing wrong with that. The problem comes in when there's a lack of gratitude for the unique individual that God has made you and me to be. The problem comes in for us as, as sinful human beings when there's a lack of contentment 
When, when all I can see is what others have, and I fail to look at what I have, the incredible, wonderful, overflowing abundance of blessings that each of us has. The, the problem comes in when we fail to make faithful use of the things that God has given us. The problem comes in when we, when we fail to appreciate the fact that, as King David writes in Psalm 139, verse 14, that I, you, we, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And, and so instead of looking at others with envy and ourselves with discontent, what we need to do is see ourselves for what we truly are. And that is first and foremost, dearly loved members of God's family of faith. We're, we, you are a part of that body of Christ. Each one of you, it says, over and over again. And God placed the, the members of the body just as he wanted them to be, just as he wanted you to be here. What we need to do is see ourselves for what we truly are, and that is, to go back to that word, amazing, special creatures, creations of God, each of which is uniquely gifted for God's plan and his purpose in our lives, and also to be a blessing to the lives of others. You know, there's that saying, grow where you're planted, and I like that saying. And I think what I'm about to say next is implied in there, but I think it's worth saying that first of all, it's okay to be the unique plant that God made you to be. Embrace that. Celebrate that. Thank God for that. It's okay to be the unique plant, so to speak, that God made you to be and to be in the specific place that God has planted you. First Peter, another, another verse that speaks uh, it, uh, the same topic here as 1 Corinthians 12, and you see that, again, that phrase or a version of it, each of you, 1 Peter 4, 10, 11, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as the one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Didn't that happen on Pentecost? What we heard about in, in Acts chapter 2? No longer afraid. And remember, just weeks prior, they were afraid. They were hiding. They were running. No longer afraid. The disciples boldly stood up in front of this crowd. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, they faithfully used the spiritual gifts that, that he gave to them on that day and into the future. Relying on God's strength, they proudly proclaimed the good news of Jesus to a crowd that desperately needed to hear it. And properly motivated, they glorified their God. You know, this congregation in Jerusalem that formed that day, that Christ established the church, and this really, this is where it kind of went next level. Uh, the congregation there in Jerusalem is a great example of the manifestation of the Spirit. You've got the apostles. Faith, first of all, that starting with them on that day of Pentecost, you have the gifts that he gave them, you have their service to the Lord, using the gifts that God had given them, and then more souls, 3,000 came to faith that day. And then it just kept snowballing after that. With more people coming to faith, more people serving. It's a beautiful example of this manifestation of the Spirit. And again, as I said before, when the Holy Spirit is at work, people do amazing things. And there are amazing results. But, but I want to tweak how we think about this word amazing and what we consider to be amazing. You know, it was amazing what happened on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls came to faith. That is amazing. That's a beautiful thing. But it doesn't have to be that big, shall we say, for it to be amazing. When a person uses their God-given gifts, that's a beautiful thing. Why is that any less amazing? When, when, when someone is hospitable, when someone is friendly, when, when, when they smile, to welcome someone, when, when, when you support someone, when, when you offer a shoulder to cry on, when you, when you celebrate and rejoice with someone who's, who's celebrating something in life, when, when you comfort someone, when you encourage someone, when you support someone, when you provide for someone, that's, that's amazing. And, and we shouldn't think of it as anything less than that. Those are beautiful things, God giving us opportunities 
to serve him and others, and that's a beautiful thing. Those are beautiful expressions of faith. We, we tend to think of those things and look at the, those things as no big deal, as common, as whatever. Those things are amazing too. Keep doing it. Keep looking for those opportunities to use the gifts, to take advantage of the opportunities that God has given to you. People coming to faith, that obviously is amazing. People seeing the love of Christ in you, that is amazing. People finding peace with God with regard to their sin, that's amazing. People like you and me taking inventory and realizing how blessed we are by God, those gifts, the manifestations of the Spirit that we're so blessed to have, that's a beautiful thing. That's amazing. Let's take inventory of what we've been given. Celebrate, thank God for that. And like the apostles, look for those opportunities to glorify God, to serve him, and to serve others with the amazing gifts, the amazing life that he has given to you as a member of his family of faith. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we praise and thank you for the fact that you are amazing. You are, you are the most amazing. You are the creator. You are, you are the one who, who lived, who died, who rose again who ascended into heaven, who, who promised to prepare a place for us, you have given us so much meaning in life. You give us a peace that transcends all understanding. You give us a, a hope, the guarantee of eternal life in heaven, which can come from no other place. You give us joy to know that we belong to you, and not only for life here in this earth, but for eternal life in heaven. You are amazing because you have created each and every one of us. You knit us together in our mother's wombs. You gifted each and every one of us. To each one of us, manifestations of the Spirit have been given. We all have something to offer. We all have value. You see value in us. Thank you for this body of Christ that you have assembled here at this time in this place, a place that we call Hope Lutheran Church, Los Angeles, California, in the year 2022. Thank you for this body of Christ. Thank you for the gifts that exist here in each and every one of us, but each, each soul, each individual here is a gift to this body of Christ. Every single one of us is a blessing. Thank you for blessing our family of faith in this way. Help us to appreciate the unique individuals that you have made us to be and motivate us by your grace to then look for those opportunities and take advantage of those opportunities to put our faith into action to use those gifts that you have given us. We pray all these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.